Thank you all. First thing I guess I better answer is your question of why am I listening to an attorney talk about R.L. Moore? Back in the early 60s as an undergraduate, I took 11 courses from Dr. Moore. I then uh, left Texas and went to Wisconsin and got a PhD under R.H. Bain. After a stint at the Institute for Advanced Study and the University of Massachusetts, I went to law school and I've been a lawyer for the last 35 years. So what I'm here to do is to give you my impressions and my memories of Dr. Moore. Basically, the theme of what I'm going to say is that it wasn't Moore's methods or techniques that were unique. It was Moore's philosophy about what was important to teach that was unique. And once you accept that philosophy, then his methods were just corollaries. They just followed naturally. So we're on the same page. Let me say, in my impression, that there's lots of books and articles about how to get the students from point A at the beginning of the semester to point B at the end of the semester. But in my experience, there's far too little discussion on where point B is or where it should be or even when it should be measured. Are you to measure this point B as the students walk out of class, the last day of class? Or is it to be measured five years later to determine what the residual value they had of that class? Now, teaching is not a one size fits all. Where point B is for that particular class is gonna determine how you should teach that particular class. For example, suppose you're teaching a class in calculus that is to be used by your students in subsequent classes the next semester, either advanced calculus, applied mathematics, physics, or whatever. They're going to need to know calculus as a tool almost as a foreign language that they've got to master. The principles of calculus are not so important to them as being able to follow the classes the next semester. That kind of class is primarily taught, in my opinion, by lectures, by lots of repetitive homework, almost as if you are teaching a foreign language, and by lots of minor exams to make sure nobody falls behind. Or point B could be what I believe is the more common math course where it's in a subject that the student won't necessarily need the next semester and maybe won't ever need for the rest of their life. But you give them a good background so that should the day ever come that they need that subject in greater detail, they'll know where to look, they'll have a good background, and, God willing, they'll approach it with confidence rather than with fear and loathing. IBL is perfect for this kind of class. Or point B could be kind of a historical cultural point where you teach the students the evolution of mathematics, its theories, its mathematicians, and so forth. All three of those point Bs could apply to any discipline anywhere in the university. But only in mathematics can you have a fourth point B which is teaching the students to think. All the other disciplines require the students to know a mass of outside facts before they even start that process. But math is all up in here, so the students can start up in here. That was what Dr. Moore was all about, and only about, at least as an, to an undergraduate. He used to say that if you knew how to think like a mathematician, then you could read anything you wanted or needed, all the books, all the journals, that's fine. But if you didn't know how to think like a mathematician, then knowledge of all the proofs of all the theorems in all the world might make you a math scholar, but it wouldn't make you a mathematician. Now we probably all know people that say, you can't teach students to think. They can either think or they can't think. Or, we know people that say, my students get all the thinking they need by watching me present my brilliant proofs at the blackboard. I would hearken back to an article in 1999 in the American Mathematical Monthly 
by Devlin, who asked the question, who was the greatest math teacher ever? And he answered it, R. L. Moore. His answer was based on the same criteria that uh, Starbird discussed about Moore yesterday. That is, he had more productive, successful, creative PhDs under him than any other professor at any other university. So to those naysayers who say you can't teach thinking, I would say to them, well, either you got to admit that us Texans are just naturally smarter than y'all, <laughs> or more could actually teach people to think. Now, in this crowd, in this conference, I'm sure all of you are familiar with the basic standard techniques that Moore used. He never lectured. He never used books. You could not read a book. You could not consult with others. What Moore would do is he would present axioms, definitions, and theorems. And it was up to the students to prove the theorems on their own and present the theorems at the blackboard to the other students. Now, Moore's theorems did go along a certain path. But that path, the destination of that path was unknown. And it wasn't important that you stay on that path. That wasn't what was important about the class. One year, for example, I gave a proof that Moore thought was interesting, I guess, because we stopped his usual series of theorems. And for a whole month, he raised theorems and questions and problems about the method of proof that I have used. So in Moore's class, the destination was not important at all. It was all about the journey. I will add, though, that I was really personally upset about that because my best friend was in Moore's class a year ahead of me, and by God, my class was going to prove more theorems than his class had. And that month, hiatus just defeated all of that. Now, Moore's theorems weren't all just overnight theorems. He would give theorems that would take a week or two to prove. Some of his theorems would take a month or two to prove. And Starbird yesterday said, you know, Moore used to sneak in unsolved problems into his classes. And I heard that. I thought, I, I, I don't remember any of that. And then I got to thinking, yeah, Moore gave a theorem once that I spent weeks trying to solve and unsuccessfully. And a couple of years later, I discovered Moore had given us the continuum hypothesis. <laughs> but this method of giving theorems of different difficulty, it allowed everybody in the class to participate. Your good students had things to work on. Your weaker students had things to work on. And it taught us what life as a mathematician was really like. I mean, how many of you have proved all your theorems overnight? It just doesn't happen that way. Now, Moore never called on volunteers. He never asked for anybody to volunteer. Instead, he would call on the person who had, had been the longest time since they went to the blackboard. Mr. So-and-so, do you have a proof to theorem number 42? If the answer is no, it works its way up. Miss So-and-so, Mrs. So-and-so, and so forth. He didn't allow those people that volunteer for everything to kind of monopolize the class. He wanted everybody to go up to the board, both the weak students and the really strong students that didn't want to volunteer, they, he would call on them. He used to pride himself and said that there never was a genius in his class that he didn't discover was there. There was simply no place for a genius to hide in Moore's class. When you go up to the board to give a proof, it was, of course, up to the students to tell you whether you were right or wrong to find any mistakes. But if you made a mistake and other students pointed it out, Moore wouldn't let it pass. He wouldn't let a false proof go by. So he'd say, I don't understand. 
The first time you heard that, you kind of thought, what an old fool, it's obvious. But after you got completely tangled up trying to explain your proof, you knew from then on, when he told you he didn't understand, you were dead meat. Now, if you gave a correct proof to one of these overnight theorems, Moore would acknowledge that you had given a correct proof by saying, oh, that's okay. But if you gave a correct proof to a one or two week theorem, Moore's eyes would kind of gleam and he, oh, that's good, that's good. But if you gave a correct proof to a one or two month theorem, Moore would kind of jump up and down his chair, oh, that's very good, oh, that's very good. And that was real praise because you knew that Moore knew exactly what you started with, and he knew what it took for you to go from where you started to proving that theorem. By way of example, when I got to Wisconsin, one day Bing gave a theorem that I spent the whole night trying to solve, unsuccessfully, very sleepily dragged myself into class, and some student claimed he had the answer. So he goes up to the blackboard, Without putting anything on the board, he turns around and says, this is a trivial application of the Tietze extension theorem. And Bing said, that's very good. And the student sat down. I was appalled. First, of course, what on earth is a Tietze extension theorem? I'd never heard of it. And second, it was OK. It wasn't very good. Actually, after that experience, I never worked quite as hard on a Bing theorem as I did on Moore's theorem. If I couldn't get it, I always assumed there was something in everybody else's background that I didn't have. There was a hidden Tietze extension theorem somewhere. You know, one of Moore's techniques that to me epitomized his philosophy of teaching wasn't really a technique of Moore's at all. It was something the students, the better students did because they bought into Moore's philosophy. Imagine that you were in Moore's class, you'd worked hard on a theorem, but you didn't get it. And imagine somebody says they have it and they start to the blackboard to give their proof. What do you do? Remember, it's not at all important that you know how to prove the theorem. It's important that you're able to prove the theorem. There is no honor in being given a free proof of a theorem, whether by the teacher or by a student. So the answer of what you do is obvious. As a student is making his or her way to the blackboard, you stand up and you walk out the door and you stand in the hall. A few minutes later, the door would open. Dr. Moore would poke his head out. Mr. Jones, you can come in now. And you'd go back and take your seat. Moore defended this on another ground. And that is, he said, if you watch a student give an incorrect proof, you would be psychologically unable to come up with a brand new proof. You would be stuck trying to correct the errors of that student's proof. Now, who should take a class like this? In my opinion, every math major should take at least one class this way. It would be as if the university offered a degree in chess. And the students in the chess department studied all the grandmaster games. They studied the evolution of the theory and strategy of chess from Anderson to Morphy to the present time. They studied the openings and the evolution of the openings, but they never played a game of chess. What kind of a degree in chess would that be? I think that people that have a degree in math ought to at least have an introduction into not only thinking, but what the life of a mathematician is like. In fact, I think everybody in the university ought to take at least one course this way. I can tell you for a fact 
there are people that graduate not only from college, but from law school, that are lawyers and judges, they don't have a clue how to really think. And I won't even mention politicians. <laughs> well, if this is a good method, should every class be taught this way? Absolutely not. There are math classes where the students have to learn things because they have to, at that school, either in subsequent math courses or in other classes, use the mathematics that they learn. I thought Moore's calculus was not a good class because he taught it for basically pure mathematicians that would only use it for the theory of calculus and it was inappable by anybody to actually use somewhere else in the university. In fact, I liked physics. I took physics for physics majors classes, but I had to stop signing up for physics classes at the upper levels because I couldn't understand the mathematics. How many courses should a student take like this? Actually, the talk after this might have something to do with it. I don't know. I would let the students make that decision. After they've started, they've taken a course or two like this, and suddenly they don't sign up for these courses anymore. They tell you something. I've had enough. But as I was preparing this talk, I was thinking, I don't recall any mass exodus for Moore's courses in the upper levels. And yet, almost all of those students must have known, they did know by that time, they were not and would never be the sharpest mathematical knife in the drawer. So why did they continue to sign up? And I can only say because they enjoyed it. They enjoyed the challenge, they enjoyed the competition. After all, local chess tournaments are full of players that know they're never going to be grandmasters, but they go to these tournaments because they enjoy the competition, they enjoy the challenge. Now, what's it like to teach a course this way? My experience is you usually find a couple of students will think it is the best course they ever took in their life. Equally rewarding, there'll be one or two students who had always been told and always believed they were not good math students and they were just hoping to get a passing grade to satisfy their math requirement. But they weren't stupid. And much to their astonishment and surprise, using the Moore method, they were one of the best students in the class. And they were astounded. And that was delightful. On the downside, though, there are some students that don't quite get it. They've never seen anything like this. And maybe that's because I didn't explain to them enough in advance what we were doing, and that was my fault. But worse, there are students that couldn't get it. When you teach a course in what I'll call the real Moore method, you will know more than you want to know about that student's ability to think. And when giving grades, I was always concerned I was not grading them on their classwork. I was grading them on their IQ. How do you prepare a class like this? What's necessary? Well, once you get the materials, the actual classwork is pretty much like IBL. Now, that means that the hour in class is pretty intense. It's like an improv session. You don't have a clue what that student's going to say when they get up there. And you've got to be on top of your game to make sure you follow what that student says. You can get a headache after the end of that class. But the real key then, what material do you use? Where do you get it from? There are certain criteria you've got to have. First is, because it's got to allow you time to kind of wander where the students wander, it can't be a prerequisite for anything else. It's kind of be a, got to be a, a sidetrack in mathematics that they can afford to go at their own speed. It can't be anything that they had in high school. You cannot allow the class to have somebody who sits in the back and smirks because they know the proof to all the theorems already and they're just watching the other students make fools of themselves up at the board. That would ruin the whole class. 
You've got to have a subject that is capable of precise definition. And actually, a lot of mathematics is not quite that way. And finally, you've got to have a subject in which the theorems are neither too easy nor too difficult, but just right for the class, with some easier theorems and some harder theorems. To do that is a pretty tall order. So you've got a couple of choices. You could either spend a decade or two, uh, as I suspect Moore did, in developing this material, or you can do the tried and true method, and that is plagiarize, steal the material. So I'm going to reveal a secret here, two secrets. In Moore's geometry class, he used Veblen's axioms. I wouldn't recommend that you go to Veblen because he wrote for mathematicians and he stuck all his axioms right there from, and you don't want to do that. That would terrorize the students to give them a bunch of axioms all at once. What you want to do is give them a few axioms, give them theorems based on those axioms. When you've exhausted those theorems, you know, okay, today, it's a big day when you get a new axiom, okay? You get a new axiom, new theorems, and so forth. Moore had his own theorems based on Veblen's method. Okay, the secret. R.F. Jolly wrote a book called Synthetic Geometry. Now, even though Bob acknowledged uh, the more in his book, he doesn't tell you what he told me. This book is his notes from Moore's geometry class. So if you want to know what Moore used for geometry, this is it. By the way, this is a secret. If you try and teach a course, and you go up and you say, OK, theorem number such and such, and you write it and read it out of this book, and your students know it's in a book somewhere, you're dead. The students will find the book, somebody will find the proofs, and then the whole class will be shot because it will be discouraging to them. The other secret I'll give is that in Moore's Foundations of Point Set Theory, he used his own book from the American Mathematical Society Colloquium Publications. And this contains Moore's axioms and theorems. And this too, you can't let the students know it exists. I'd like to kind of close with a couple of personal stories that maybe reveal a little bit about Moore's character. He had a, a sense of humor that could be kind of impish at times. One day after class, he stopped me and said he'd been in the administration building and he'd heard my name. Some kind of mistake, he said. I should go to the administration building and clean it up, fix, fix it. So I hurried down to the administration building, go to the desk and give him my name. The guy disappears, and he comes back a few minutes later with a check for $600 for me. Completely unknown to me, Moore had gotten a scholarship for me, and the way he sent me down to pick it up was to tell me there was a mistake, I ought to fix it up. <laughs> On a more serious note, when I was a senior, I decided, for reasons I won't go into here, that I would go to Wisconsin and study under Bing. But, and you probably all have been in a situation like this, I did not want to tell more until I knew I could go to Wisconsin, until I knew I had the money to go to Wisconsin. And you know what happened. Moore found out about it anyway. And he was really hurt. One day he came to me, said, look me in the eye, the sooner you leave, the better. He was really hurt. A few years later, after I got my degree under Bain, I was visiting in Austin. I, my parents lived in Austin. And somebody in the math department said, well, while you're in town, you ought to go see Moore. And I explained, yeah, but Moore and I had had a falling out. And he said, yeah, but for your dissertation, you proved a good theorem. And Moore would forgive anybody, anything, for that. 
Sure enough, I knocked on Moore's door, and he was delighted to see me. We had a conversation for an over an hour, and that was the last time I was ever to see him. In summary, Moore was not about conveying knowledge at all. He was about conveying a skill, the skill of thinking like a mathematician. So in some sense, maybe we really shouldn't refer to Moore as a teacher. Maybe we ought to refer to him as a trainer, a master trainer, the greatest trainer of mathematicians ever. Thank you. course with him. What was your first course with Moore? The short story is it was his geometry course. The long story, well, that's just a personal, I'll tell you, a personal story. No. Uh, I took it when I was in high school. Uh, you took what? His geometry course when I was in high school. Yeah, okay. I, the University of Texas had a program for the top 30 math students in the state of Texas. Well, my dad knew Dr. Etlinger, who was in charge of that program, and set me up with a personal interview with Etlinger. Sure enough, I had the interview, and 30 days later, my invitation comes, and I, sure, I took it, but I felt bad for years after that, because who else can go have a personal interview with the guy in charge? Okay. A few years later, Bob Jolly was with me, and he says, you remember that math program? Yeah. He says, did I ever tell you a story about that? I said, well, no. He said, well, he was a graduate student at the time, and he was walking down the hall, and Dr. Etlinger came to him with a stack of papers. Yay, hi. He said, Bob, we've selected 28 of the people in this, for this program. We want you to go through this stack and select the last two. Ooh. Now, it so happened that Bob Jolly was the second best chess player in Austin at the time. And so happened, I was the best chess player in Austin at the time. So when Bob gets to my name, psh, it gets pulled out. So it really made me feel tremendous hearing that story. It wasn't my dad's influence. It wasn't my mathematics that got me there, but it was some my own credit that did it. Okay, next question. What, what was your second course with him? It was the calculus course. Calculus? Yeah. Now, you didn't have the theorems in and definitions uh, for calculus, did you, that you alluded to? No, the calculus, I said Moore never lectured. Yeah, he kind of lectured. He kind of used a little IBL, but he, it was, his emphasis in the course was still very theoretical mathematics. It didn't give me the tools I needed for later. I just wanted to clear up that the <clears throat> calculus wasn't the, didn't fit the rubric that you had. It or, did not, and okay, I, I wanted to yep. make that clear, because <laughs> I, 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 I knew it didn't. Paul Forrester, Alamo Heights High School, San Antonio. Um, when I went back to UT to get my uh, graduate degree, uh, I um, read some of the dissertations written by Moore's students. They were very short. How long was your dissertation? Well, my dissertation was under B. Oh, okay. However, well, I, I'm going to puff myself a little bit, okay? Um, there was a theorem that J.H. Roberts had proved in 1936 for the plane. And it was unsolved for dimensions higher than two for 30 years. And people had worked on it. And uh, by a quirk, I got lucky and I solved it. So my dissertation was just the proof of that theorem. And it was relatively short, yes. It amazed me that, uh, the, that his students would spend years working on something and they could summarize it in three or four pages. <laughs> now I have to point out, John here can correct me about things I say about Moore because he uh, also uh, knows firsthand, as does uh, uh, Jim, wherever you are. <laughs> Thank you all very much. <laughs>